My name is uh, Gerardo Quinones. I'm an alum of Pan American University, this campus in 1977. I've been uh, since then working uh, in uh, software development in many, many different industries uh, in many parts of the United States, uh, from the aerospace to now uh, media delivery, audio and, and video. Um, this presentation is based on work that I did uh, when I was working for Analog Devices, a company that uh, builds integrated circuits, digital signal processors, and in this particular case, codecs. Uh, codecs are the devices that uh, convert uh, digital information into audio signals. Uh, when the when this market uh, got going, uh, you had something like a sound blaster card on a regular PC, it would cost you between $150 and $250 uh, to have audio on your PC. It was uh, quite a chunk of change. Uh, Codex came along and allowed you to put something directly on the motherboard, shrink it down, shrink the entire circuit of a sound blaster card into uh, a little codec that at first cost you from five to ten dollars and then it went down and down and down. Uh, nowadays, maybe they sell for uh, five cents. Uh, so you have a full sound blast card on, uh, on your devices that for basically nothing. Uh, but what drives this is, uh, is an audio driver that is responsible for taking the information and converting it into signals, uh, talking directly to the hardware. Uh, and uh, writing drivers for this is a pretty tricky uh, business because you're dealing with uh, an electrical device, you're what we call bit banging, to control this device. And these devices can have manufacturing errors of all sorts, and part of the, the work of uh, working with uh, audio drivers is to work around these defects so that you don't waste a couple of million dollars on a mask that has some defect and then you have to start over. So somehow you've got to get it to work for us. And then the market is uh, was very much divided. You have different uh, vendors that, that sell the, uh, the chipsets that work with either the high-speed memory or low-speed memory uh, devices on your machine. Uh, that's what's called the North Bridge and the South Bridge. The North Bridge deals with video and deals with uh, high-speed devices. And uh, the South Bridge deals with USBs, codecs, and so on and so forth that are considered low uh, low uh, bandwidth. And uh, you have different vendors that have different kinds of uh, technologies for controlling these devices. You have uh, memory-based I.O., you have port I.O., you have configuration space I.O., and all of these things. Um, this is the market that into which somebody like analog devices comes in and has to sell a codec to all of these vendors and say, use my device and I'll make your life easier because I will deliver a single driver that will work with all of my codec models, no matter what version of the, uh, of the chipset you're dealing with, et cetera, et cetera. So it was quite a challenge. And uh, in order to do it, uh, we had to go into what was at that time very radical. Uh, technology. Uh, we're talking in 2003 of writing a kernel level driver in C++ in an object oriented language, which was unheard of. At that point in time, drivers were being written in C++ at best with a lot of uh, the low level banging uh, in inline assembly. So in, in order to get to uh, uh, a viable solution, we have to take this code and refactor it, rewrite it in place, start taking bits and pieces of it, 
and rewrite it in an abstract language and reverse engineer the work of uh, decades of, of different software engineers' uh, labor. Try to understand what it is that they were doing at the time and understand it so that we could abstract. Um, as a result of this, there was a lot of controversy about, uh, it appeared that in the process of refactoring the code, comments were disappearing. So the code itself, the, the size of the code was being reduced and a lot of the, the comments were disappearing that the management started getting concerned about that. And that's what forced this presentation. Uh, prior to this one, an explanation of what code refactoring was. And then after that, try to explain to them what was happening to the code. Um, so when we asked for feedback on the refactoring, the things that they had came back and said was, well, you need more documentation than your code. Uh, you need more statuses. And uh, there's a lot of information that's missing here. And we said, well, yes, all of this is true. But it has nothing to do with refactoring the code. Uh, these are issues that you have to address no matter what software development project you're involved in. And it's no better or no worse because of the fact that we're refactoring the code. And what we were pointing out was that, hey, we're getting into this code and trying to understand it. It wasn't well documented to begin with. Documentation is supposed to help maintenance. We're the maintenance engineers. Why are you asking us for the documentation? Where was it to begin? So, um, so there's the, the why we have unreadable code. Uh, this is uh, this is an issue, particularly with this kind of software. When you're doing software development that is so close to the hardware, uh, there's a lot of compromises that you have to make for efficiency, for uh, getting around defects, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, performance drives a lot of the constraints on how you write the code. Uh, and as an example, um, let's see. Oops. this is going in the wrong direction. So um, one example here is uh, is an algorithm uh, that is uh, the shell sort algorithm, which in its the basic algorithm itself can be written in maybe about eleven or twelve lines of code. Uh, but when you look at it, um, thank you. Yes. All right. When when you look at an actual implementation of the code, you have uh, something that is an order of magnitude larger, and it's not code bloat. It's uh, all of the additional code that you see there is uh, dealing with very specific cases to make the algorithm highly efficient. Uh, and uh, you don't have to, uh, and, and without them, you basically have an algorithm that will work some of the time. But in, in, you present it with any kind of edge case and it'll crash. When you're dealing with something that is going to be a utility, that is going to be used uh, by many different parts of the system, you have to make sure that it is robust, that it can tolerate errors, that it will not break, and it will continue working no matter what. And that's especially the case with these uh, drivers. So uh, in terms of comments, uh, there are programmers who don't like to comment their code. They say that their code should be inherently readable you don't, you don't need any, any comments, uh, just read the code. Uh, well, 
none of us here are Dennis Ritchie or in that level, uh, ACM Turing winners that uh, wrote and designed languages like C and uh, the Unix kernel and then originally an assembly code then rewrote it in C, reran it through their own compiler, and then generated the systems that we see today. I wish we were, but we're not. So as a rule, we need comments to compensate for a less than uh, brilliant <coughs> coding structures and constants. Why we have unreadable code? Because we have to make these compromises. Roger Tedwick's algorithm uh, is a 19-line uh, program, and the actual implementation is uh, 130 lines. Uh, the extra 111 lines are not code bloat, but the result of carefully engineered and extremely efficient implementation. The extra lines represent the difference between theory and practice. Uh, the, the driver that we wrote uh, had to deal with an operating system that sets the rules through a common object model. Uh, and um, we, in order to build a driver that would work no matter what codec we were dealing with and what chipset we were dealing with, we have to isolate ourselves from it because the model of, of the COM says, you give me a specific piece of code that will work on a specific configuration of hardware. And that's it. Different configuration, give me a different driver. And what we had was one size fits all. So we had to create an isolation layer and it itself became a, a complex nightmare to, uh, to maintain. <coughs> so, um, what's the big deal with uh, comments? Um, well, comments are code, and it has, and they have to be maintained. Uh, if you change the code, you have to change the comments. Otherwise, the comments are use useless. So, uh, you're spending uh, additional effort to keep this extra code around, and the question is why? Yeah, what's the reason? Well, it depends on, uh, <coughs> the, the right amount depends on what your objectives are. Uh, the size of the library that you're, that you're building, how big is your project team? How many people are working on it, and how much do they have to communicate? Uh, the skill level and experience of the software engineers that you're putting to work on this Communication barriers such as language. Uh, you can have people that have uh, different languages working uh, on the same project that happened in Space Lab, where uh, by and large everyone was working and commenting their code in English except the French, who insisted on commenting their code in French. Uh, and that became a, a pain point. Uh, what development tools you have available? Uh, and that has changed through time. Source code uh, uh, repositories are now very commonplace, but at the time they were just beginning to uh, be in use. And uh, personnel turnover is another reason, that another consideration. If you have a lot of turnover, you have to have more comments because otherwise you're going to forget why you did things. Uh, and the problem with these commenting styles, whatever one, whichever one you select, is that it doesn't scale. As your project grows, the amount of commenting that you need changes. Comments are necessary. Uh, they're not harmful. Uh, and they're, by and large, they are necessary, but they have to be maintained. Uh, they shouldn't state the obvious, because you, you're wasting your time if you're repeating your Uh, and uh, I like this uh, quote from uh, Kathy Stark in uh, her book, uh, Programming in C++. If meaningful and mnemonic names are used in programs, there's often only occasional need for additional comments. If meaningful names are not used, it's unlikely that any added comments will make the code easier to understand. So if, if your code is obtuse, the comments will also be obtuse. Um, put together a taxonomy of the different kinds of comments that you're likely to find in software. Uh, the first one is boilerplate. Uh, that's something that appears at the head of every piece of code. 
that basically says this company owns this code, do not touch it uh, without our permission. It's boilerplate, it's required by the lawyers. Add it and you move on. Don't worry about how much space it's occupying. Picket fences, uh, if you have, uh, whenever you see picket fences, which are just long strings of, of symbols that separate bits and pieces of the code, it's an indication that you have this enormous uh, file that's combining multiple things that have nothing to do with each other. And you're just using that to, so that you can find them uh, in the code. If, if you see that, that's a signal that you should break it apart into smaller pieces. Tombstones. This is, uh, it's usually an indication that a programmer is making a change, but he doesn't know whether he's going to regret it. So he keeps the old code in there, dead code, commented out, just in case he has to go back and turn it on again. But if you have uh, source code repositories now, that's no longer necessary. You can always go back to what the code looked like before. And the tombstones are just occupying space and distracting you by telling you how the code used to work, not how the code is working now. Both marks. Uh, you see a lot of these when there's work in progress. Uh, stuttering is where the comment repeats exactly what the code already told you, so it's not adding any information. Uh, explanation of the code, summary of the code, and description of, the, of intent are the only good types of comments, the ones that actually add value. Uh, they explain how the code does things, why it's doing them, and uh, those are the things that we should uh, concentrate on. So here's some uh, recommendations on what you should comment. Uh, anything that gets around an error or in a non-documented feature, that's a good thing to, to document. Uh, don't try to document how the code used to work. Um, and uh, Kerning and, and Flower uh, emphasize don't document bad code. Rewrite it, and uh, I think you should. Inline comments, this is another style of comment where every line ends with a comment at the end. Sometimes they're useful, but uh, you end up spending a lot of time just lining up the code. Anytime you make a change to the code, it misaligns the comments, and, uh, so you try not to use those. Uh, maintenance note example, here's Here's code uh, that uh, has some inline comments. You can see it. Does this thing have a? Well, uh, you can see it on the on the fourth line. For a second, on the third line, right in the middle of the code, you see the slash star that comments out <coughs> that line uh, because that's what the code used to do. It was checking to see if the bits per sample were eight, but now we're checking to see if it's eight. Is 16. And then it was maintained further. Now you have that code, uh, an additional line of code, line of code commented out entirely, and the new line of code added. The working code decreased, but the bulk of the code has increased. Comment line tells you how the code used to look, even if you don't care. Uh, from a refactoring point of view, which is what started all of this, and by the way, the, the, the back story of this is that analog devices at the time was seeing that uh, the chipsets were being commoditized to the point where uh, they needed to reduce costs. And the way they were going to reduce costs was to outsource software development to China. So it was imperative for them, for us, to document all the work that we were doing so that we could train our replacements and move on to other things. Uh, so when they saw that comments were disappearing, they suspected foul play. Someone is removing the information that we need. Oh my god, stop it. Uh, so this, these presentations were to explain to management that it was OK, chill out. We're not trying to screw you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, refactoring does not advocate eliminating all types of comments, but it does try to eliminate 
the explanation of the code type of comments. After refactoring, we find that the original explanation of the code comments are superfluous. And I'll show you an example. <coughs> Uh, so, so here's an example on the um, on the left side is the code, the original code that appears to be commented. It's got a lot of comments. Uh, so, integer x uh, read code at register 72, and then it says register 72 holds the codec model. That appears to be a, a, a valid comment, but another way to do it is to use the judicious symbolic names for your variables that explain exactly what you're doing. Uh, you have the, instead of ha using magic numbers and then explaining what the magic number is, you have symbolic variables like analog devices 1981A, that's a codec model, and that's the, uh, the value that you're going to see when you read a particular register, if it's that. Uh, then uh, register 72, well, we define a variable called codec model register, and we give it the value of 72. Now we don't need a comment that says register 72 is the codec model register. We just use it. So you see, uh, when you finish, you have the same code, but you now have no comments at all. So uh, first of all, this refactored pseudocode is not an example of well-documented code. Uh, the inline comments that were present were only compensating for poorly written code. Refactoring eliminated the inline comments with no net loss or gain in actual information present. By eliminating the comments that didn't contribute information, refactoring made the absence of useful documentation painfully obvious. And that's what management was reacting to, is the rest of the company. Well, they weren't there to begin with. Uh, so self-documenting programs, a basic principle of data processing. Uh, and here's the other thing, is they wanted a separate document to describe what the code was doing. And uh, th there's problems with that, because anytime you try to maintain two different sources of truth, they're going to get out of sync. And then you're not going to know which one of the two uh, is, the, is the real one. Um, we often violate this rule that says that uh, uh, trying to maintain independent files and synchronism is, is, uh, is fault. Uh, and then the end result confirms our, this teaching because we often end up looking at documentation that has nothing to do with what the code is doing. Uh, does it make sense to separate the documentation from the code? Sometimes. Uh, if you're selling the product, you want a separate document that you're going to present to the people who are trying to buy the product, and it's going to highlight features and benefits and whatnot, and it's not necessarily going to be working code. Uh, or when the code doesn't exist yet, and you're just designing it, uh, it makes sense to have a document that is not code. Uh, for division of labor, if you're going to take the work, you're going to give it to multiple people, then you're going to have to have a design document that says, here, you do this, you do that. Uh, or if you're going to outsource the code somewhere else, you're going to need documentation, separate documentation to explain what the code does. And also, finally, to hide and protect for proprietary code. Sometimes, the documentation you present is different than the internal code that may have some company secrets that you don't want to necessarily share. So you have a separate document that is available to the public and then a private document, the code itself, that you keep internal. Uh, a Microsoft uh, driver development kit documentation includes sample code for various driver types. This is an acknowledgment of the inherent deficiencies of the driver development kit documentation. Despite it being enormous, they, after they go through great lengths explaining how all the code is supposed to work and what it is that you need to do, then they give you coding examples because even with all of that documentation, it's not clear. And then uh, when issues arise regarding the published APIs and the DBT 
okay, uh, we always consult the sample code as the final arbiter for correct implementation. If there's a discrepancy, the coding example is what we go to as the truth. Uh, programming style can be uh, used in lieu of documentation. If you use the correct variable names and you use the correct function names, a lot of the times the need for extra commenting uh, goes away. You think of functions as being verbs and think of uh, symbolic variables as being words and start writing things, start writing your code as close as possible to how you would uh, describe something in English. Um, well-written code, uh, with, in well-written code, comments are just the icing on the cake. Um, here's a few things to look after uh, in uh, your self-documenting code checklist. Do the routines name describe what, the, what, what it does? Does each routine perform one well-defined task? And so on and so forth. Data organization, control, different things to consider when you're uh, writing code that you want to be self-documenting. Um, layout and design. Is the code straightforward and does it avoid cleverness? It's, sometimes we uh, kill ourselves by writing something that we think is particularly clever and then two days later we look at it and we have no idea what it does. And uh, that's basically it. Some references uh, recommended. Uh, as you can see, they all predate 2003, which is when this work was done. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, hey. that you have, guys? Yes. Just with the sample code that, that we saw, I'm not a programmer, but it seemed that the comment part of it was shorter than the post, I guess, than the section without the comment. That's, yes, that is true. How is that better from your point of view? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, something that we often neglect uh, is the use of white space in our code to make things easier to read. We feel, we, we somehow think that by reducing the volume of code, we increase the, the density of, of information in it. But in reality, you need to, white space is, is something that helps you separate things and, uh, and, and make, them, make them stand out when necessary. Uh, so I am not against volume of code, per se. Um, but the, the point there was, and as I, as I did mention, that wasn't a good example, just an example of how what appears to be a comment is superfluous and disappears by just changing the name of a variable and not using magical numbers. Does that answer your question? I guess just because that wasn't a good example. Is that, is that it? Uh, no. Uh, it wasn't a good example, but white space will add bulk, uh, and uh, and it's okay. The, don't go by the number of lines of code. Don't don't go out there and try to rip out code so that uh, it reduces the number of lines. That doesn't uh, <coughs> doesn't help. What we did got get rid of were the comments themselves. Yes, sir. What's your opinion of Microsoft's Hungarian notation? Uh, uh, Hungarian notation. Um, refresh my memory. Uh, including the type of a variable in obscure characters at the front of the variable, and P capital I in the name of something. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, that, that's a very, very long conversation. Uh, I'll just I, give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down. <laughs> I'm against it. Uh, I think you end up in a lot of philosophical arguments about what is the proper notation and you end up losing track of what it is that the code is supposed to do. Uh, I, I use camel case sometimes, I use snake case sometimes in the code, and I, uh, I, I use punctuation marks sometimes. I don't know, and, and I don't really follow that kind of uh, accounting of 
variable should begin with this letter, or it should have capitalization to separate the words and so on. I was just wondering if any of the companies that you've worked for have insisted on it. Yes, numerous companies, and they all insist on it, and then different generations of, of developers come in, and they come in with their own ideas, and then they start holding words. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much.